But the, it was LAMS that helped found quite a few um, organizations. Everybody knows that there's a strike on right now? Strike of writers. Guess who helped found the Writers Guild? LAMS. LAMS started the Actors Fund. LAM started ASCAP, LAM started SAG-AFTRA, LAM started um, Actors Equity. Any, any organization with an acronym that helps LAMs collect money or actors and actresses collect money, the LAMs got to start. Um, but I'm really, really happy to have tonight's event. I want to thank Magda for organizing it. First of all, who here is a Broadway insider? Who loves Broadway? And who is this stage right? Who is that? A martini for the first person who can tell me the name of this gentleman right here. Nope, not George M. Cohen, who was a lamb. Is it the wolf? Not the wolf hopper, he's over in the corner, he was another shepherd like me. When you become the shepherd, you either get a portrait, like Clay and Green, or you get a bust. So should I get a portrait or a bust? Oh, yeah. <laughs> not William Gillette, who was also a lamb. Not Barrymore? Look at that nose, that's not John Barrymore. Although John, Lionel, and Maurice Barrymore were all lambs. Here's a hint. He was a co-star with Kitty Carlisle. In? Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Night at the Opera? The Marks show? John. No, not Cyril. Oh. Oh. oh uh, Bing? 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 Bing. Bing. Not Bing. Oh. Not Bing Crosby. No. Uh, you guys are all striking out? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm taking your first Schneider tickets away. This is William Gaxton. Who was, a, who was a lamb for more than 12 years. So this is what Kitty would have been looking at when she was in a show called Of the I Sing. From the show they were in together. I've never seen So it's great to have Bill Gaxton back. And if you want to see a painting of him, he's in our billiard room. Um, so we're really, really glad to have Chris Hart with us tonight um, with, with Foster Hirsch, our, our uh, I was about to say executioner, but that's, that's not the word I was looking for. It's not that kind of night. Um, Chris is the son of a lamb. So Moss Hart joined in 1945, and his partner, George S. Kaufman, was a lamb as well, too. And Chris is the only person whose mother's name is on a matchbook in our history cabinet over there. And what was the show? It was the... Gaxton. That was the... That with Gaxton. Was, so it was Gaxton. with Gaxton. You just showed me and I should yes. have remembered. Yes. <laughs> yes. So but there was no picture. Book. What was the name? So Kitty is here. So Kitty is, in, is uh, it, with us tonight. So um, I want to bring up Foster and I want to bring up Chris. And we're going to have a fantastic evening. I hope you guys will all join us in the, in the pub and restaurant afterwards, which is on 2M. They're happy to take your credit card if you're not a lamb. And if anybody's interested in joining our fair company, I'm happy to talk about it, as is Magda, any other lamb, and we have applications in the back. So please welcome Foster. Uh, let you know what I did for in preparation for tonight. I thought I would reread his father's autobiography at one, and I innocently started it on Monday, and I couldn't put it down and I got behind in everything I was supposed to do anyway, because this took precedence. It is, it has to be the greatest theatrical memoir ever written. I would also say that, I would also say it's one of the greatest American books ever published. It is extraordinary. And Chris has written the introduction to this edition. He's going to sign it for me later. But Act One is, is an amazing achievement. Do you recall your father's attitude about it while he was writing it. It was published in 1959. Uh, he, he was very um, concerned about writing a, an autobiography. He, he had been only writing plays and musicals and sketches for people. And, you know, Chris, you want oh, Hi. you want me to hold it? So uh, he, I remember him starting it you know, at least in the early 50s, and having um, so much concern over it that he would read, he would read portions and give people, uh, 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 well, no, he actually wanted to hear their responses right away, so he didn't give them pages. He read out loud this book over and over again to all of his writer friends and actor friends and so forth and so on. So uh, eventually, he was just getting nothing but positive responses. And so it was a very, uh, 
um, you know, good thing that after he had this time after My Fair Lady before Camelot to actually get it done. It, was, it, it gave him so much pleasure. I mean, he was just so thrilled that it was on, you know, both the New York Times and the Herald Tribune front page. <laughs> and rave reviews, and am I correct? It is still in print. Yes. Thank and goodness. And you still get royalties. <laughs> you still get royalties. I have one in my pocket. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the beauty of the writing is reflected in this wonderful dedication for my wife, Kitty Carlisle, the book that she asked for. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Just, just the right number of words. Just beautiful. beautiful. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to introduce uh, one other person here, which is uh, part of the family. And uh, that's Kathy Hart, Dr. Kathy Hart. <laughs> or memory of the Hart family, I never forgot it. Do you remember a show called Edward R. Murrow's Person to Person? <laughs> and I remember seeing it as a kid, and the cameras went into this glamorous apartment, and there, there, there were, of course, <coughs> Kitty Carlisle and Moss Hart, but then these two lovely children, I'm told, seated on a piano bench in this magnificent apartment, and a feeling of awe and envy swept over me. <laughs> I thought, are these kids lucky? Did you, were you aware how privileged you were growing up with those parents in that apartment, in that environment? It was a, it was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 I loved them, they loved us. We had, we had a wonderful family. Um, and then every once in a while, I, I wanted um, not to be uh, the son of a celebrity. And uh, it was very hard to come by. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I had a great childhood. There was no doubt about it. We lived in this palace, a, a duplex penthouse on Park Avenue. It has a, it has a name, a, a novel written over. It, 1185 Park Avenue, oh. and it was just magnificent. It was, uh, and I'd go over to other kids' houses, and I'd go, "Well, why are they living in such slums?" <laughs> um, I didn't understand, but it was, you know, it was, it was that kind of uh, place, and um, the the feelings, um, you know. My dad passed away when I was 13, so it, it was really too too short a time for for him for me. And uh, he was he was just wonderful. He he adored both Kathy and I. And um, you know it was it was it was really hard on Kitty, and and uh, uh, she struggled for a while, and then she became. Kitty Carl, <laughs> you know, it was, it was, uh, she blossomed and she became head of, um, you know, the New York State Council on the Arts. And when you give away fifty million dollars to anything or anybody, they love you. <laughs> but, but Chris, growing up, was there any pressure one way or the other about you and Kathy entering the family business or staying away from it? No, no, never. And Not, nothing neither, one way or the neither, other. Neither, 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 neither one way or the other. I always had interest in, in um, you know, what they were doing and wanting to be in it with them. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be whatever. Um, I wanted to really play the castanets the way that my mother did it in Carmen. That's what it blew me away. Every every rainy day, I'd, I'd make her go into the closet and get the castanets. Um, but no, no. But I did. I acted in 
um, college, I was in the um, the uh, uh, the acting seminar. There was only one little little tiny bit of acting at Harvard, and um, that that's what it was for only for freshmen. And uh, Andre Bishop was in my class, and. Uh, I was a pretty terrible actor, kind of cute, but not, not good, and I enjoyed directing him. He was a terrific actor, by the way. Anytime you see him wandering around Lincoln Center, um, you should imagine him in a Moliere play. He was just spectacular. So um, we've been friends for, you know, Generations. We just had our 50th um, last year. What one of the startling points in the father's book, and I was struck by the candor, a sentence I'll never forget. He, he talked frankly about his parents, and he said, I understood my mother, but I didn't like her. Yeah, I was, I was surprised by that. I mean, I, I, I couldn't quite... And he explained why. Yeah, he well, I understood. I understood. You understood. Yeah, she had a hard, hard life, and she was in charge of taking care of uh, all these people. They had to take in borders. They were so poor. My father never got out of the eighth grade because they needed his, you know, 50 cents uh, to help the family. They had you know, borders that they had to feed and live with um, in, in, in the apartment that they were renting. Um, Dad, 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 would, Dad used to say he was born on 105th Street and uh, 5th Avenue, the wrong end. <laughs> <laughs> but he makes, he makes no bones about finding poverty and the Bronx unbearable, yeah. that his, he, his childhood was unbearable to him. And he was ashamed of, it seems to me, of having grown up in, without. Um, well, he, he was embarrassed, I think. The only thing that embarrassed him was the, the educational part. And um, because the rest he could handle. Uh, he, he wanted to have uh, learned more in school and I can't imagine anybody who has read more and been more literate than my father um, and he he was an amazing uh, l literate person it comes through in the book and, and so he read and read and read and read and and, and that's really um, how he got you know um, to where he was uh, in the, he, he sort of started out in in in, in little uh, local places in, in Brooklyn, and uh, you know uh, went to the Catskills, uh, to the hotels, and played. And he, he he went to every show in New York, you know, uh, mostly in the second act. When he was <laughs> and um, and so he then would put those shows on in these hotels for all the people who hadn't seen them <laughs> already. And um, it was, you know, he, he wrote he wrote stuff, he pretended to be characters. You've read, you've read all the but characters. I, I've read all the characters, but I loved his honesty. He, he said in the book, what you, the statement you just made tonight, he realized he wanted to be an actor too. Yes. And he realized, being very honest with himself, that it was never going to happen for him. He had that one extraordinary opportunity to play against Charles Gilpin and yeah. Edward Jones. Yeah. And he thought, oh, I'm going to be a star. But he was very honest and realized, no, he was not going to be a star. More than that, he wasn't going to be gainfully employed as an actor at all. Was that honesty part of his personality when you knew him? I mean, a very direct self-assessment. Um, he, he wasn't uh, self-deprecating in any way about it. Uh, I, I felt he was, you know, uh, proud of uh, what he, he was able to do. And the only things that he made jokes about were, um, you know, the, 
the fact that he hadn't, um, he felt that the oldest child, which he was, always got the education and they got to graduate at least from high school. And so that really bugged him and um, he would always make jokes about, he, you know, the graduate school he was going to, which, which, which he called uh, Hebrew U. <laughs> <laughs> did, so, did you get to know your Uncle Bernie? Yes, loved Uncle Bernie. It was, he was a wonderful, funny, funny man. And, um, you know, part of the family. And he was always around, and we loved him, both Kathy and I. And, um, was he the only relative? Of the only one. He was, he, he was seven years younger, and uh, uh, he had a problem with a, a bit of a withered arm, so it, it was a, a real trial for him throughout his life. But he became a wonderful stage manager, especially for um, Dad's plays. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he was... Uh, you know, the stage manager for Camelot and uh, so forth. So, um, but as kids, your father writes regretfully, they were strangers to each other. In a way, because of the differential in their, in their ages and the fact that they didn't see each other very much, Dad had to go to work every day uh, after, I don't know, how, how old are you in seventh grade? I mean, 12? 12, yeah. yeah. So, um, and seven years before that, uh, there, there wasn't really an Uncle Bernie yet <laughs> that we grew to love. Um, but once he stopped and looked at him, he realized, this is a wonderful person here, but I haven't gotten to know him. I'm going to get to know him. He yeah. pauses in the book to make that statement. Yeah. It's, very, yeah. it's really, very moving. Did you yeah. get to know George Kaufman at all? Oh, yes. Oh, Mr. Kaufman. Yeah, he was a character. And uh, you had to behave around Mr. Kaufman, and there was no doubt about it. He, he was a no touch, no hello, no goodbye. It was that, was, that was hello, and this was goodbye. <laughs> and he called your father, Er. Yeah. Never called him by his first name. That would be too intimate. Well, no, I think eventually they were able to talk to each other, but that was the way it started, and he was very difficult, and he was, he did not um, uh, like uh, children. How <laughs> 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 else to put it? He, if you, you had to be very quiet around uh, George, and I remember sitting and looking at him. First of all, he had uh, hair that went straight up, like <laughs> Frazier, uh, you know, I mean, what, what, what's Kramer. Kramer, Kramer, Kramer. <laughs> and he wouldn't touch it, he wouldn't, uh, he felt that it would, would harm his hair if he combed it. <laughs> so it was all, anyway, that was, and it was a strange look, and it was very strange, you know, uh, no touching. But in a passage in the book that would make anybody weep, your father says, opening night of once in a lifetime, George Kaufman tells the audience, 80% yes. of this play is Mozart. That was very and, and rare. And your father said that, that kind of generosity yeah. is so rare in a field like the theater. Yeah, no, he, meant, he didn't mean in George, he meant in the theater. In the theater. Yeah. And yeah. that was just a beautiful gesture, and I was very uh, moved by that. I, I read the book uh, a lot, uh, and uh, especially now that I'm writing about them. And uh, uh, I, I I have always tried to read for other people, and uh, especially the Christmas story, you know, after Aunt Kate leaves. Yes. And it's just a, just it's a tight, beautiful, sad moment that has some heart to it, and I'm, I can never get through it. I don't, I'm always bawling towards the end, so I cry a lot. Um, <laughs> the character of Aunt Kate is unforgettable. Aunt, unforgettable. Yeah. And, and a lot of it is made up.
I have to I have to tell you that in my book I have researched all that stuff about Aunt Kate and um, when she died uh, in particular and how she lived on far beyond the time that um, Dad had uh, she'd been kicked out of the house by because she was uh, supposedly, uh, according to some of the gossip, um, she was messing around with um, my grandmother, uh, Lily, and so Lily didn't want. Lily found out and told. So it, it was. Well, it that's was not in the book. For no, no, <laughs> no. But she was. She she did do all the things that helped Dad get a taste of the theater. She loved the theater. Yeah. That surely was absolutely. Funny. And she did all those uh, matinees with him as a little boy, and he got to see all these wonderful shows because of her, um, and. If, you know, I think if mom and dad knew he, he was sneaking out of school um, with Aunt Kate, that would have been, uh, she would have left sooner. There, um, there are two dramatic versions of Act One that I know of. The 1963 film oh, with George Hamilton, directed by Joe Tori Sherry, who was a friend of your yes, father's. Yes, they grew up together. They grew up together. Yes. And then the, the recent, not well, fairly recent Lincoln Center, uh, yes. James Lapine production. Yes, that was okay. The, the George Hamilton <laughs> film, the George Hamilton film, obviously strikes a bad note. No, for you. I mean, no, I, no. My dad wasn't uh, suntan like that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything accurate in the film? Is there anything? Genuine? I never watched the film after the first five ten minutes. Oh really? I got. I mean, I heard that. I heard that. Uh, the Kaufman, Jason, Robert, Jason was wonderful. Interesting casting yeah. for Kaufman. Yeah, I thought he'd, I heard he'd done a, a great job, but I've never gotten through the whole thing. I but Doris Sherry knew your father, and he was an intelligent guy. Yes. I, I mean, I've seen the film, but dispassionately, I think it's underrated. It's not that bad. It's not, it's not good enough, but it's not, it's not a travesty. Are you telling me I should go look at yes, it? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Chris is writing his yeah. memoir. Yeah. which we're all going to be looking forward to, to reading. Yes, you have to see the film okay. and comment on it. <laughs> okay. How was the Lincoln Center production, in your opinion? The Camelot? No, not no, we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, the, um, oh, this Act One. Act One. James um, James. I, I had problems because uh, I really don't want to disparage anybody, but I had some problems with it. Um, I, was, I was going to be... Uh, uh, co-writing it with uh, the writer and um, he wanted to do it himself and Andre was his friend and Andre was my friend he was put in a bad position and uh, the thing that really disturbed me about it was the the um, set that won the Tony Award for best set of the year it was just it just over overran the the show, and it, I didn't feel like we could really have some intimacy with the characters because of this huge thing that had a turntable, and it just took over the whole play. And the other thing that annoyed me about it was <laughs> that no one could ever reproduce it. So there would be no reruns, there would be no, no money coming in from you know royalties. So it was just a waste. It's overly elaborate. Yes. Overly elaborate. Yes. And, and, and Borat is a spectacular mm -hmm. designer. He, he's, he's, he's on the list for Tony's this year as well. Um, the play is recalled most, I think, for its set design. Yes. People talk about the extraordinary. I thought it was extraordinary, but do you feel it overpowered? It overpowered the, the, the play, and it made it made it much harder for it to be reproduced. Well, let's segue, since you brought up Camelot. Uh, Moss Hart's last theatrical engagement was as director of the original Camelot, 1961. 
starring, get this cast, Richard Burton, Julie Andrews, Robert Goulet, Roddy McDowell, not too bad. Uh, have you seen the version of Camelot adapted by Aaron Sorkin, now playing at Lincoln Center on the stage of we're at one. Yes, I have. But before, uh, before I uh, tell you about that, I, I want to mention how I first saw it. This was in uh, 1959 or 60, and we were Kathy and Mom and I were traveling to um, Toronto to the opening of the new O'Keeffe uh, Theater, which is a huge, beautiful theater that was built almost for Camelot and designed for Camelot, at least. Um, and we were driving in a taxi cab from the airport, and I was listening to the radio, and it was the news. And all of a sudden, I hear, and Moss Hart's in the hospital. And it's, uh, uh, what? <laughs> I said, well, did you hear that? Nobody heard it. So we just listened again to the radio, and then another five minutes, Moss Hart uh, in the hospital with a heart attack. And we were still in the car, still in the taxi cab trying to get to the hotel. And no one, you know, no one had been able, this was way before what's in my pocket, you know. There were no, you can't phone anybody from a taxi cab uh, in Toronto. Um, so anyway, it was a real uh, uh, difficult situation, and uh, Dad had to stay in the hospital forever. I mean, it was just, um, and, and the show, uh, with even with that spectacular cast and the beautiful music, had problems, and Dad was not able to fix them. He had to. Uh, consigned the direction to uh, Alan Werner, which was not his thing. And um, he, when he finally got out, it was at least 10 months, but not 10 months, 10, 10 weeks just to get out of the hospital and then another little time. He, he was able to, uh, he, he, they had announced on the Ed Sullivan show that they were doing the entire hour as a tribute to Lerner and Lowe. And so they're going to show all those shows, you know, Brigham, you know, My Fair Lady, you know, whatever. And Dad said, no, we're going to, he didn't tell anybody, but he said, I'm going to fix up Camelot so that it can really work. And he spent, um, it was probably in 10 days, maybe, uh, on all of the problems that he hadn't been able to fix when he was, you know, uh, working in, in Toronto. And he turned it into a hit. I mean, it hadn't really been selling until people even saw even it. with that cast, it hadn't been selling. No, no, I mean, and, and even right after My Fair Lady, I mean, the, the, the you know, the, the, the money was there. People wanted it to be good because, because of My Fair Lady uh, and Julie and all, all that stuff. But um, he, he, he brought it back and, and the box office called him. He said, Moss, you better come down here and see what's going on. All of a sudden, there was a line. And after all these weeks when it hadn't, it was really just beginning to, you know, lose steam. And he brought it back. So uh, that was the, uh, the other thing about Camelot was, uh, I, I think I was, oh, God, I was probably about 12 or 11 or something. Um, I got to see him rehearse, and that was another wonderful experience, to see him in action. And, you know, the thing that I became, um, because I'm not an actor, um, was a director and a producer. And I watched him, and he was so beloved by his, his company because he was so both direct and, and calm and um, 
personal. He would he would take people aside. He wouldn't just scream and yell and say, "Do this, do that." You know, it was just a wonderful thing to be able to to see that as a young man. And he had great success in Act Two of his career as a director. Yes, yes, he directed a lot of other shows. Uh, he directed Mom in that uh, anniversary waltz with. Uh, like Donald Carey and, uh, and of course My Fair Lady, which is the biggest hit of his career. Yes, yes. The biggest hit of anybody's career. But going back to Camelot, <laughs> even with your father's rescue operation, that book is problematic. Yes. And the problems of the book have only been magnified by the current production. <laughs> yes, I mean, taking out the magic did not help. <laughs> It's drab, it's joyless, it's yeah. dark, it, it's miscast. Um, anything else? And I'll tell you what I really think. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say any of these things because of my friendship with Andrew and, 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 and Andre. And, uh, but uh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> what was your father's proudest accomplishment? Do you know? Uh, I think his family. I think Kitty in particular, and uh, Kathy and I, right nearby, uh, he really enjoyed being a family guy and having, having uh, found, he'd been looking and looking and looking, and he found somebody that was exactly what he was looking for. And my mother, had been after him for <laughs> 10 years. She, she met him on the set of um, the Marx Brothers picture, A Night at the yeah. Opera, because they were looking for, the, uh, George had been writing the Marx Brothers stuff, and um, they were uh, looking to do a, um, a musical. And um, they, they said, you should look at this singer, uh, Kitty Carlisle. And so she supposedly, it's in her book, you know, they each wrote their own book, but um, Kitty supposedly ran because it was Moss Hart and um, <laughs> who wrote Jubilee? Come on. Come Cole on, you. Porter. Cole Porter, thank you. Um, Cole Porter and, and Mozart had come to see her on the set of A Night at the Opera. So she ran and ran and ran and fell at his feet. <laughs> That's her story, and she loves to tell it. Um, anyway, um, but it, they were, they were bumping into each other all over the place for 10 years, and it didn't ever click until, I, I really don't know what made the difference, but you know, they were both um, ready to um, kind of you know, look for something else. He had, he had been very much involved with uh, George Kaufman's wife, Beatrice, and Kaufman's had a very, very strange arrangement and very public. They were an open marriage and they had a very difficult situation that had happened early on in their marriage, which I won't go into, but uh, um, they, they, they needed each other, they loved each other. George wouldn't do a, a single thing without her approval, and she was an excellent editor. And so she was wonderful too, but um, she kept him, on, she kept dad on a kind of a leash. She had many, many other lovers, so did, so did Kaufman. Kaufman was the, the, the chamberlain of, of <laughs> characters in that era. I mean, he was on the cover of Time Magazine for the, the business with the... Uh, but how does that square with his not wanting to touch anybody? <laughs> you, put, you didn't want to shake hands. He asked, he, he, he'd been asked that by the, the ladies, and, and, and they all said the same thing. He said, in, in this area, touching is fine. <laughs> but what you just said illuminates something for me in the book. I thought 
when your father gets the descriptions of the Kaufmans, they're both vivid portraits. Yeah. But there's a special energy when he gets to writing about Beatrice, and now I know why. Yeah, now they, they were very close, and uh, they were supposedly um, platonic lovers. Uh, who knows? Uh, I couldn't really figure it out, but they, they dearly loved each other. They thought they might end up with each other, even though she was running around with a bunch of other writers. But um, she, she, uh, she was, I think, about uh, eight or nine, ten years older than, she, than he was. Um, and so there was a kind of a mothering thing. That, but they were very close. And um, he, he wrote to her every day when he had taken um, uh, the man who came to dinner out um, during the war, out to entertain the troops in the South Pacific. And he wrote to her every day, and they, I have these letters. And the, his, his daughter, Kaufman's daughter, had found a package of letters from Moss to Beatrice, and they all started with, um, dearest lamb girl. And then it, it, he just, it, they, he, he would say things like, uh, tell, tell George, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I couldn't write two letters, or just read him this letter. And it was such a strange arrangement, but they, they made it work. They, they all... you, you mentioned, Chris, that uh, George Kaufman didn't like children. He had a daughter, Anne, yes, who's, they were who's good. been a good fe family friend of yours, and she's yes. still with us. Yes. And I'm assuming you keep in touch with her or yes. see her from time to time? Kathy is her doctor. <laughs> Just by accident. <laughs> so there's still a Kaufman and Hart connection yes. to the present moment. Your father went to Hollywood only very infrequently. He hated Hollywood. He hated Hollywood. Yes. But when he went, look what he produced. Gentleman's Agreement, Hans Christian Andersen, A Star is Born. Yes. Not too shabby. Yes. No, he, he did well, and he, he used the money to uh, hightail it back to New York and, and do what he really cared about, which was the theater. He didn't like writing screenplays? Uh, not, not especially, because he didn't have the same, you know, um, uh, uh, control. Thank you. Who's that? <laughs> Your buddy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, he was head of the Dramas Guild for, uh, president of the Dramas Guild for, I don't know, five, six, seven years. and uh, He was a lamb? Yes, yes. Uh, right and so he, he wanted to, he, he felt there was something about just reading about it today and something. Um, he, he felt there was something about the theater and the, the, the way it was contained in a, in a sense, even though you could reach people very clearly and, and, and get, get them to feel things. With a camera, it was so much bigger and it, was, it depended on the director so much more. And um, he, he he, he had a big problem with um, the, the wonderful, wonderful um, um, uh, Stars Board because it was so good, uh, but it was too long. And um, he, he, they didn't, uh, they had promised not to cut it too long, and then Jack Warner got involved and just went too. <laughs> So what you can see now is not nearly as good as the original. There's, there are a couple of places in the movie where there are just a picture. And, uh, uh, but the, all of the music and all of the, uh, the words are there. And your father wrote Judy Garland's famous dressing room scene. Yes. It's a great scene. Yes, no, they were wonderful. It, it, it got what the... But the original uh, first couple of uh, uh, weeks and uh, all the reviewers got to see was so spectacular that you wouldn't believe what they said about it. It was like 
this was the most amazing picture of all time. Judy Garland should be given the Academy Award now. And they, it, it started out at uh, three hours and 12 minutes or something. And, you know, it, now that could have been utilized. They could have made something with that. Uh, it, but the, it was so popular and they wanted to see it so badly that the, the, the theater owners demanded to, they could only show one uh, uh, screening of it at three hours and 15 minutes. So they cut it down to two hours and 10 minutes. I mean, that just is a horrible thing to do. But there is this new version where there's, there's some some actual footage missing, but you could hear Judy. He was in love with Judy. I mean, he just thought Judy was special and spectacular. She, he thought she had something extra, and to use that phrase, I think that was somebody else actually said that. And you, but, you uh, feel that his writing is for her. It allows her to present the emotional person yeah. that she was. It's a wonderful showcase for her, dramatically. Yes, uh, she and she was still, uh, you know, suffering and, and feeling um, sad. And uh, there had been, even though the, the the show was going well and she was uh, doing well in in in, in, in the filming, so she went to a party at. Uh, Swifty Lazar's, and uh, supposedly somebody said, why did you let your mother die in a parking lot all alone? Well, that was, that wasn't, that wasn't very nice, but she went into Irving Lazar's um, bathroom and, and tried to hurt herself. So, um, you know, she was still that vulnerable. And it was, uh, you know, Dad wrote her a letter, which uh, is is uh, going to be in my book. And she wrote him a letter back saying, your letter meant so much to me, and I read it every day, and I will continue to read it every day. And it is what makes us such good friends, and you have helped me so much. And it, it's never been printed. Uh, and, uh, so uh, that'll be in the book. You and, and Kathy lost your father when he was young. Yes. Tragically young, 57. But your mother had a wonderfully long life. Thank goodness. <laughs> 96. Yes. And, and I, did, I did know your mother at near the end of her life. Extraordinary. Well, but she, but she just what was amazing fun. about her was that her act three was stronger than her act one. In her 90s, right. she was a better, deeper, more confident, more, more compelling performer than she had been when she was in her 20s and 30s. Yes. She only got better and better. How do you account for it? I, I, I've been doing a uh, 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 production of uh, You Can't Take It With You in California. And uh, they asked if, uh, uh, if I could bring Kitty out to do her show to help with, with business and so forth, because it was just about to open. And um, this is a big theater. Uh, um, and I went backstage, you know, about five minutes before it was about to start, and her head was on the table, you know, the dressing table, and she was just, I mean, she wasn't, crying or moaning or she just she just wasn't you know she had no energy and uh, I said mom you don't have to do this well, I'm going to do my show and it's going to be fine we're doing you can't take it with you and everybody's going to be wonderful and blah 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 you don't have to come out tonight this is they were just trying to you know jack things up a little bit and while I was talking the, her music started, and her head 
Yes. She looked at herself and she walked out and she gave a hell of a performance. And she was half dead. <laughs> is that at the El Portal in North Hollywood? No, it was at, uh, what was the name of the damn theater? Somebody, some, some actors. But I, is I, anybody from California? But I, I saw her show, and you were there at the yeah. El Portal in North Hollywood. Yes. And that was a remarkable performance yeah. that night. Don't know. Come on. Who's from LA? Yeah. I grew up in LA. Okay, what's the, besides the, the elements and what's the big theater? Mark Taper? Oh, the Hollywood Bowl. No. <laughs> Not that. Geffen? <laughs> Was it Geffen? Geffen. Geffen. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Who said that? His name is my name. Anyway, um, you know, so that was going to be a, a they, were, they, they did well anyway, but for her to just bounce off at, just hearing her entrance music. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. Well, she, she performed until near the end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she, she was performing in the fall of the year she died. Mm -hmm. She went to Atlanta, didn't she, Kathy? Well, she performed in Feinstein, uh, December. Uh, yeah. She, she passed in uh, April. Yeah. Was there, and she had everything wrong with her. I mean, she had every disease you could possibly have, and she still, she just ignored it. She had three cancers, and she had, you know, a, a serious pulmonary issues, and she had, God knows what else. But it, she just wanted to keep going, and it it served her very well. And it served me well, that basically, because you know we'd had our ups and downs during my um, adolescence that went on for a few decades. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I finally, we finally got to be really good friends for another 25 but, years. But did you respect her after all for most of her life? She was a single working mother. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, she had. She had money. She had, um, you know, a great uh, sense of what what she could do. And uh, being head of the uh, uh, New York State Council was a really big help because she got to meet everybody and be welcomed everywhere. She would go to two or three parties a night and, and an opening. You know, I would I, I when when I was in my thirties. And when I was in my, I should say, when I was in my prime, <laughs> I couldn't possibly have lived her social life. I couldn't have done it. What was it that, that created that effervescent personality, so gregarious, loved people? Was it her mother? No, her mother was very mean. She was a, <laughs> she was a hard woman. Um, Did you know Hortense? Yes, yes, Hortense. Did you know her? Heidi, yeah. Dad had a habit of, of reinventing on everybody in the family. And he reinvented positively what they should and could be. And it was, she was called Hortense and she hated that name, so he renamed her Hydrangea. <laughs> which is the French flower. And she became that French flower, and she would dress differently, and she felt, you know, um, nicer. Um, her, the she had great ambitions for your mother. She was a very ambitious mother. She thought that that was her, that Kitty was her future, and she was uh, right. She said this uh, famous thing that, that Kitty always reminded us about. She said. After the first time she saw her in a, um, a play at RADA in, in England, um, I think she only got to play the first act, but she, she came in and um, told Kitty, well, you're not the prettiest girl I've ever seen, and you're not the best singer I've ever heard, but I think we're going to find uh, what we're looking for in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> 
So she had always been thinking about um, English royalty or some kind of European royalty because she actually said out loud, because it's in her book, that the uh, European royalty weren't as anti-Semitic as the um, Protestant Americans. <laughs> So, um, but, but she hardly raised your mother as a Jewish girl. No, but she never denied it. Well, she she did she denied it. Heidi denied it. We called it Heidi. Um, <laughs> Kathy and I. Uh, she there was a famous line. That they were both in a taxi cab together, <laughs> and uh, Kitty and, and and Heidi and Kitty got out, and uh, the taxi driver said. Uh, wasn't that Kitty Carlisle? And, 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 and Heidi said yes. And she said, yeah, is she Jewish? And uh, Heidi said, well, she may be, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and of course she was. <laughs> now, Chris, we, we're among friends here. Your mother publicly had enormous charm. Was that a performance? Was there some? Was there a different person at home, or was the charming Kitty Carlisle present at home as mother? <laughs> <laughs> you know, she could be. She could. Be, you know, I I was away a lot. I was in boarding school. I was in college. I went to California to to do you know, um, theater and uh, television. Yes, we had our ups and downs until we it got better. And um, she was difficult, and she would occasionally say hurtful things that you didn't know where they came from. But I, I think they came from Heidi mm -hmm. because she was she had she had been so difficult. Here, would, her father her father died when she was ten, you know, Kathy, Kathy's age. And she left where they had been living in, in uh, Shreveport. They went to New York, and then they went to Europe. And um, it was just the two of them. She had no relatives, no family, I mean, Kitty, except for this, this woman. And when she would get mad, she would just kick her out of the room and lock the door and leave her in the hall. And if some, you know, uh, uh, waiter or something had been nice about it, they'd, they'd give her some food, but she'd be out there for days, <laughs> occasionally, days, without, and then the, the tide would break, and she'd be back in, and, you know, they, I'm sure they had, uh, uh, you know, some kind of uh, love for each other, but she was so harsh, I can't believe that some of, the things that that got between us didn't come from Heidi. This this is going to be a fabulous memoir, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> I can't wait. Do you have a title? No, I really don't. I mean, what? <laughs> uh, anybody anybody want to suggest a uh, yeah. yeah, we have to stop now, right? Oh wait, I want to read one yes. little short thing. Is that all right? Sure, sure. Uh, take questions. On. Yeah. Some of you may have heard, heard this because I read it in my... Uh, but this is part of the book so you get a sense of what you're going to be able to read, hopefully. Uh, okay. This is, this. When I was 11 years old, a small anomaly appeared on my usually better than average academic report cards. <laughs> Suddenly, although I scored well in aptitude tests, my reading comprehension was way off. Hmm. Mom scoured the city for the best reading tutor in town, and I remember going from the Trinity School to an upper west side apartment 
For about a year, there I learned about my reading difficulties and how to compensate for seeing words backwards, upside down, or swapping words and numbers around. Whatever the tutor did, by the time I was a senior, my comprehension had improved, and I ended up scoring well enough to get into several top-notch colleges, including Harvard. I graduated from Harvard. I fell into a tem 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 tempestuous yeah. where was that P? <laughs> relationship with Cynthia an older woman a divorcee with two children who was getting her graduate degree in education also from Harvard you can imagine what my mother thought of Cynthia <laughs> it was the 70s and I helped Cynthia with her seven year slog to her PhD for my troubles, I suffered through seven years of dimly lit, mahogany paneled annual faculty slash graduate student teas, where very sweet sherry mixed with an arduous small talk about where one stood vis-a-vis -vis Jonathan Kozol's latest <laughs> book concerning the appalling state of inner city schools in America. The dean of the graduate program at the Harvard School of Education was Dr. Jean Chaw. Quote, she's the one who invented dyslexia, end quote, was the way she was usually referred to just before Cynthia received her degree. One of her fellow PhD students and friend, Ann Meyer, was to be married. A niece of Catherine Graham's, the publisher of the Washington Post, the event was going to be a glamorous affair at the Graham's North Shore estate. Cynthia was one of the maids of honor, as were several of the other grad students in the PhD program. They were all intimidated by their professor, Dean Chow. So I was asked if I would drive Dr. Chow from Cambridge to the wedding. I had been served seven years of syrupy sherry and seven years of hearty howdy-do's under my belt, so I was happy to drive the three hours to Falmouth. Trying to find conversation that might interest the professor, I somehow recalled my long-ago after-school reading tutor in New York. I remembered she'd had a machine in her apartment where you could insert a book and it would mechanically reveal the words either one at a time and then one line at a time, if necessary, and at an adjustable speed. Soon I was explaining how this cool machine kept the reader's eye from jumping ahead or going backwards, messing up the meaning of a sentence. <clears throat> also how this tutor had taught me some other tricks to keep me from turning sense into nonsense. I thought I caught a hairline fracture of a smile on the professor's face. Perhaps you know this device. <clears throat> Sorry. I started to ask, and I didn't get the word device out of my mouth. Instead, I whispered, as much to myself as to her, that was you. <laughs> and she, as her smile blossomed, I said, oh my God, you knew all along, didn't you? <laughs> of course, she said. I knew the first time Cynthia introduced you seven years ago. <laughs> Why didn't uh, I? Uh, professional ethics, she said. If you didn't want it known, very professional. No, it wasn't that at all. I was 11 years old I, when I first met you. I, I, I just never put two and two together. You, you could, could, ah, she could see I was getting choked up. You were one of the first students to be helped by my new teaching methods and theories. I was just developing dyslexia. The fact that you had done so well and had gotten through Harvard and overcome dot dot dot. We were both getting choked up now. I am so pleased to be finally able to tell you how proud I am of you. 
I pulled the car over and through my tears I asked Dr. Chell if I could give her a, a long overdue hug. Oh, yeah. Do we have some questions for Chris? today about a lot of things, but I was recalling something that involved you, and I'm the same age as you are, and it was an appearance where you made on YouTube, uh, sorry, on To Tell the Truth, Oh yes, where you were in heavy disguise and Mrs. Hart didn't recognize you, and uh, I checked on YouTube. And it's there. No, it's Watch there. it this afternoon. Joe Garagiola. <laughs> yes, exactly. His son, his son was on there too. It was just an amazing thing that, that she did the entire show yeah. and seriously asked questions, and it never dawned on her that she was talking to. Yeah. Her oh, and, and and who was the guy sitting next to her? Uh, was giving her such a, Oh, Tom Post, and he was just giving her. Oh no, no, it was Joe Garagiola himself, the the, the, the baseball catcher. And he was just going, oh, you didn't recognize your own son. Oh, I can't yeah. believe this. And he was just giving her the elbow. And then they get to the third guy, <laughs> and he's and he's a, he's dressed up. As, I was dressed up at least as a as a, an old man, uh, kind of a, yeah, a nice professor. Nice yeah, uh, at Columbia, I I thought maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this guy was just a bum. He had he had he had his. You know, no teeth and and stuff coming out of his eye and you know, terrible <laughs> clothes. Yeah, horrible, horrible clothes. You could probably you could barely understand him. And he said, uh, "Sir, uh, and and what's your name?" And he said, "My name is Joe Caracciola Jr." <laughs> Other questions? I am hoping soon, let's put it that way. I, I, I have the same publisher and the same editor as my friend here, Foster, and uh, I invited her today, uh, but she was busy and she couldn't make it, but she was interested in seeing my new um, pages, and she said so, so we'll see how it goes. It will go well. You've got a story to tell, right? Yes, uh, yes we have a question. Um, can you tell us something about George Abbott or other men yeah. your dad worked with? Yes. Well, I, I didn't know George Abbott when my father worked with him. I knew George Abbott when my mother worked with him on, on your toes. Did you see that? I've read about it. I did. <laughs> it was uh, this wonderful kind of uh, half ballet, half musical comedy, and uh, Kitty played uh, a major role, and she replaced somebody. Dina Mero. Dina, yeah, she, Dina Mero was the original person in the show, and I watched, she was, she had to uh, audition, and this was very rare, I mean, you either wanted her or you didn't, you, you, you didn't, you hadn't missed anything, she'd been in movies with, you know, with, uh, Different directors. I mean, she was known as an actress. She had been in plays and so forth. But he wanted her, and he's he was like in his nineties at the time, uh, maybe late eighties. But um, she had to audition for him, and she said, "Would you come with me?" And I said, "Sure." And he, she did something, you know, and she sang something, and she did it very professionally, and, and she said thank you and walked out, and he said fine. And she did it for at least, I don't know, six months, almost a year, uh, on your toes. And he was, uh, you know, he was very famous, but I didn't know him until, you know, way at the end of his career. But they were very close. You, they yes. didn't. They did know each other quite well. Not Kitty, but Moss. Yes. Why did your dad hate Hollywood so much, and did your whole family go out there when he was working? Um, we went out there. Uh, we we went out there first for um, um, 
the uh, Star is Born, because Dad thought that it was going to be a kind of a short stay, so Swifty <laughs> and arranged uh, for us to stay uh, to rent Frank Sinatra's house and um, in Palm Springs, and I learned to ride a bicycle there, and I'll remember that forever. And uh, I, the other thing I will remember, which is quite interesting, is that it was the butler, John, who helped me and taught me how to ride a two-wheeler. <laughs> now, Dad was not into the athletic stuff. We didn't throw a ball around. Um, but Mom did. Mom, <laughs> Mom would take us to the park, and Kathy and I could play baseball and do other, you know, throwing things. And, uh, and but she was right. He had his first heart attack when he was, uh, you know, in his, in his 40s. So anyway, um, I was with him when he had that first heart attack too, as I recall. And, and, you know, so he had two heart attacks before he passed away on the third one. And so she didn't want him to even carry a bag. So going to the park with the kids was mom's doing. It. Yeah. Uh, so what was the rest of the question? Why did he hate Hollywood? So? Oh, he hated Hollywood. Well, well, first of all, he didn't have as much control. I, I, I think we talked about it a little bit earlier. And um, he didn't have, you know, the say-so, uh, especially if he, he, if he was writing and directing, which he did occasionally. He kept promising himself that he wouldn't write plays and then direct them uh, as plays. But in the movie department, um, he would never do that because there was a whole other world to him. He would only do the writing and um, help the director. Um, and he'd give him ideas. But uh, he didn't like it because it, it wasn't the theater. And the theater was special to him and he'd grown up in it and he loved it. And he, he, he made it his, his own special you know, um, place. You know, dinner is waiting for us down in the pub, but you asked me to remind you to tell a, a very funny story with Lauren Bacall as the co-star. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> we'll end with this. <laughs> okay. Um, one New Year's Eve, Kathy and I and Mom went to uh, a... We decided to go to a, a series of New Year's Eve parties, and we decided that Betty McCall and what's his name? Jason Robards. Jason Robards <laughs> would be the best place to end up because they were going to be playing all night long. And I always liked uh, Lauren McCall, Betty to her friends, and she liked me, and I was probably about, well, 16, maybe 17. <laughs> And we were, the music was playing, people were dancing and drinking and having a great deal of fun. About 1.30, because we'd already been to three or four other, you know, parties. Mom said, it's time to, it's time to go. And um, so we, um, we let Betty know that we had a wonderful time and we had to head to the door. And so she came with us to say goodnight. And um, she went around and she kissed Kitty and she kissed Kathy and then she kissed me and she put her tongue uh -oh. down my throat. <laughs> <laughs> 16, 17. It was the best moment of my life. I will never forget it. We always smile at each other when we bumped into each other <laughs> because she was she was uh, she was a pal. <laughs> I mean, Mom loved her too. <laughs> Chris Hart was the one first time.
Chris, and also Kathy for coming. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, and William Gaxton. It's probably the most attention he's gotten in about 60 years, but after looking at his profile for the last hour, I definitely don't want to get a bust. Um, but thank you so much, Chris. We'll meet you down on 2M. Thank you. Happy year, welcome.